Okay, so we're going to go through uh, analog IC biasing references and regulators today. And so um, there's sort of a few different pieces to this section. First is just a bit of general talk about biasing strategies. And uh, then there's more specific discussion about um, some bias circuits that generate basically the bias voltages that are required on current sources in uh, CMOS analog circuits um, to establish, for example, constant transconductance. Then the section on references is more about absolute references, like a band gap voltage reference that produces a precise, relatively precise absolute voltage. Um, and then finally, the section on regulators is is about circuits that are used to kind of clean up power supplies, make sure that they're relatively free from noise or that keep them stable. So um, now the first the first material is kind of introductory here. So all these play play a role uh, in analog circuits. Um, so a reference start with a reference circuit shown here. A reference circuit, as I said, is something that provides an absolute reference, which is not easy to get on an integrated circuit. I mean, any of the quantities that we talk about as constants on integrated circuits, whether it's carrier mobility or oxide thickness, or they all vary uh, a lot. A lot of them vary over temperature, and if not, they vary over manufacturing process, you know, one chip to, to another by huge amounts often. Any resistors, any, any values that we have. There's very few things on an integrated circuit that, to grab onto that, that don't change uh, a lot. And, the main one that's used is basically the band gap of silicon. So um, usually it's, there's different ways to make use of that quantity uh, to create an absolute reference circuit. So we'll just look at an example of that. So that provides an absolute reference. So you have to think about where is it that you actually require an absolute reference in an analog circuit. I mean, internally within a chip, you know, really, you don't necessarily care whether a signal is precisely at 800 millivolts or 900 millivolts, right? Uh, if, you know, all the circuits that are there are all on the same page, right? Uh, as, you know, really, for example, uh, if you have some kind of analog interface circuit that's an A to D, I mean, if there's an amplifier that provides a full scale input to the A to D, that full scale could be 800 millivolts or 900 millivolts. Either way, the output of the A to D is going to be the same. Right? So as long as the amplifier and the A to D are on the same page and they both agree on what full scale is, the value of full scale is kind of irrelevant. It can change. So that's an example where really you know, what's needed is some kind of internal biasing that establishes some uniformity across the signal path in an analog circuit. An absolute reference is really, I would say, mostly only needed when you're, the, the chip is kind of talking to the outside world. Because at that point, you probably have to provide some kind of specification to whatever else is connecting to the chip. You have to be able to tell people, okay, the swing here has got to be restrained within a certain number of volts. Even then, I mean, you may not have to be very precise about it. It depends, right, what you're, you're targeting. So, I mean, this may seem very abstract, but I think it's an important point because a lot of times I, I feel like in analog design, people use absolute references and they really don't need them. You know, you really don't. Uh, and, and it's and it's you know, there's extra complexity there, and and it's and sometimes there's extra um, cost in hidden ways. Uh, absolute references can take extra test time. Sometimes they need trimming and things like that when they're being manufactured. So, you know, I think it's always worthwhile to think about if you really need an absolute reference or not. And really, the only time is if you're kind of talking to somebody else, right? Uh, and and you need to agree on something, uh, some some values. So bias circuit is then what just what provides all the internal circuits with the sort of supplementary DC voltages and currents that they need to typically, to, as we talked about last time, just to keep them all the transistors operating in their proper place, uh, operating point, you know, operating mode, the certain transconductance, whatever it is. And then finally, the voltage regulators sit like that, usually between the power supply and particularly sensitive analog blocks, sometimes also including the bias circuits themselves. Noise on bias circuits are, can be just as bad as noise on signal path circuits. So bias circuits as well sometimes live underneath um, voltage regulators. And so their, their job is to basically shield that circuit here from outside noise, as well as from 
other circuits on the same chip, I can induce noise as well on the power supply just by the waveforms of current that they draw. So we talked about this before, but basically there's lots of different ways to bias. Even a simple differential pair like that, you may wish to bias it for constant gain, constant voltage swing, constant power consumption or current consumption, right? All those result in different biasing strategies. So I think the first part of, you know, looking at biasing for an analog circuit or for a whole analog chip or an analog signal path is to think about what you're trying to achieve with the biasing. It's really the very fundamental first thing you're trying to do. What's the most important thing to you that you hit th this spec or that spec? Is it the power spec that's most important? Is it the gain or whatever, right? And that dictates the biasing and it dictates a lot of things about, about your design. And where the rubber hits the road on that is actually when you put together the bias circuit. So one of the, so again, we'll talk about different ways to establish biases. I mean, one would be biases that provide a constant transconductance, could require absolute uh, biases, right? If we want to draw an absolute constant current. So we'll, we'll go through a couple of these different possibilities. And then people, and just keep in mind that for any given application, sometimes people mix and match these, right? They use a constant transconductance circuit over here. Maybe they need an absolute reference over there. And so all, you know, even once you know the basic, the, the goal, right, of the just two hours or whatever we're going to have today is just to get the basic premises down. And then, you, you know, there's always variations that people come up with on their own. There's a million, everybody's got their own favorite bias circuit. You won't necessarily find it in a textbook, but you get the, the point is to get the basic premises. Okay, so here's the basic core, a core little circuit that's often used to help generate constant, like a bias voltage that when applied to uh, a current mirror results in a current, a bias drain current that uh, turns into a constant transconductance through any transistor bias to that current. So it's kind of a long, a long story there, but we'll see how it's used right here. So, so the key starting point here is that, you know, can be seen by recognizing these two transistors here form a current mirror. In this case, in this example, with a one-to-one -one ratio. The numbers beside each transistor, so they're W over L ratios, okay? Um, but really, it's just their relative size that's most important for now. Um, so, you know, again, you can tweak the numbers once you understand the premise. So since that makes a current mirror, just to keep things simple, we'll do sort of a, a rough analysis, approximate analysis at first. So let's say, therefore, that these two currents are the same. The drain currents from Q10 and Q11, they flow all the way down through the drains of Q12 and Q14, and all the way down through the drains of Q13 and Q15. There's nowhere else for them to go. There's no DC current in the gates. Right? So it's the same constant current, ID15 and ID13, all the way down through them. So um, these two, if these two transistors down here have the same drain current, but you'll see they're sized, right, with a four to one ratio. So if you have uh, two transistors with the same drain current, but one of them's four times wider than the other, uh, there's a square law for MOSFETs that tells you that that means that the V effective, the effective overdrive voltage of this guy has to be four times, uh, sorry, twice as big as the effective overdrive voltage of this guy, okay? This so the one to four ratio creates a factor of two in effective overdrive voltage. Now if you zoom in on this, so let's say these two transistors now, they have, they're matched well enough that we assume they have the same threshold voltage. So over here we've got um, a threshold plus V effective of 13. And over here, we've got a threshold plus V effective of 15. But because Q15 is four times bigger, its V effective is half that of Q13. Okay. 
So the difference in the VGS, right, between Q13 and Q15, it appears as the drop across the resistor RB. So RB sees across it the other half of V effect of 13, which is the same as the V effect of 15, right? So that's the key point here, that's the key trick if you like. Um, so that that voltage drop here uh, is uh, RB times this current, this bias current ID 15. So that's the voltage drop there on RB. And if that has got to equal V effective 13 over 2, so that's just rearranging that expression over here, okay? And then one more um, rearrangement here. Let's go and, and we can write that 1 over RB equals 2 ID 15 over V effective 13, right? So that's just a rearrangement of this expression here. And then just go one step more. V, v effective 13 over 2, right? We've already established, sorry, over here is um, V effective 15. So you got ID 15 over V effective 15, right? So that means that this now looks like the expression for the, the transconductance, right, of MOSFET. We can also write this as 2, I, because ID 15 and ID 13 are the same, we've also got this here, right? So that is just GM13, right? So the point is that now this, this circuit, by the way, you know, but because that current mirror is pushing the exact same current through two transistors with a size ratio of 4 to 1, what it means is that GM of this transistor, in fact, neglecting things like the body effect, all the transistors, all the NMOS transistors here are all matched to the value of RB. Okay, so that's the, the key point. So that means that uh, if mu n C ox changes, this VGS on 13, Q13 will change uh, if the temperature changes, that VGS will change automatically so that at all times uh, GM equals 1 over RB. Okay? Which is, that's, which is kind of neat. That's the point of the circuit, right? Um, so there's, now this is not, you know, you might say, well, that's not really a constant transconductance exactly. It just means that, you know, GM now depends on some resistor value. The resistor value itself you know, depending on how it's made, may also vary with temperature and other things. So you've got, there's two main uh, possibilities that are, that are used with this kind of circuit. One is to just put RB as a really precise off-chip resistor, okay? So you can, you know, get an SMT resistor with 0.1% tolerance for a few cents or whatever, and boom, now you've got a, tr you know, a con transconductance that's truly very, very constant. Um, but that's a, that costs you a pin, right? Now you have to have a, use a pin on the chip in order to do that. So you may or may not, your boss may or may not afford you that luxury. Um, another possibility is that you, you just put RB on chip, okay? So for example, let's say you make it a poly resistor on chip. Uh, in that case, as we know, our, the value of RB can change quite a lot. From one chip to the next, it may vary by plus minus 15%. Temperature changes, it'll certainly vary. Uh, a little bit for every degree Celsius change. 
So now we no longer really have a constant transconductance, but what we, what we still have, right, if I rearrange this further, so I've got gm times rb equals 1, right? 1 is a pretty good constant. So in that case, if we make rb with a poly resistor, what we've done is we've created a bias voltage and bias current that we can use to ensure that gm times poly resistor value is always constant. And that could be useful even in a simple circuit like this. Right back to this, that's exactly the biasing strategy that would ensure constant gain from a simple circuit like this. So the idea here is you use the, the constant transconductance circuit to produce a drain current, ID13 in that case, right? That ensures constant transconductance for NMOS, or sorry, that ensures an NMOS transconductance that is inversely proportional to poly resistance, right? You mirror that current, ID13, you just mirror it over and produce a kind of copy of it, some kind of copy of it over here. Now that current is used to bias these NMOS transistors. So, uh, again, we're for now neglecting some second order <coughs> effects, but roughly speaking, that would ensure that GM of Q2 and Q3 is inversely proportional to some poly resistor somewhere in the chip. And you go and you make these resistors up here out of the exact same poly and you even, you know, you take as much care as you can to ensure those resistors look the same as the one on the bias circuit, same sizing and all that. Um, if you do that, then now you've basically um, ensured that this diff pair has a relatively constant gain. Okay. So that's that's how you you might use a circuit like that. So this is a you know a, a relatively simple version of this. Q14 and Q12 uh, are provided just because then you have a kind of a cascading that ensures that these drain voltages are the drain voltages on Q13 and Q15 are almost the same, right? So that just kind of keeps them biased in the same way. Um, but you can go once you understand the basic print really. You know, Q12 and Q14 are not really necessary for, for the, the simplest version of the circuit, if you like, right? The basic premise would still be there. You, all that's really required is this combination of the same current, or not, I won't even say that it needs to be the same current, but you need to establish this four to one ratio in current density, right? And when you establish that four to one ratio in current density, you have a kind of two to one ratio in V effective assuming the square law is valid. And then you put that difference, that sort of delta in, in overdrive voltage, and you apply that across the resistor, right? That's the basic premise. So there's plenty of problems, um, you know, as I said, second order effects that, that plague this circuit. Uh, you might have already started sort of spotting some of them. One of them is that this is a pretty simple current mirror up here. So those drain currents won't be exactly the same. And uh, so then that kind of breaks the whole relationship that we were, we're relying on. Um, other um, issues are for, that we kind of glossed over are, for example, that uh, there may be a body effect on Q15 here. Uh, because the source is not a ground, if the body's a ground, then uh, actually Q13 and Q15 will have slightly different threshold voltages because of the body effect. And then again, that screws up one of the assumptions we made in, in deriving the relationship there. Um, and there's um, there's even you know even even stability of this circuit is kind of non-trivial. Um, I'll just just quickly point out that there's a basically a you know a feedback loop here, right? So one one way to consider that is to say that from this gate to over here. You know, imagine we break the loop here. So from this gate to this point over here, we've got um, basically what looks like a source degenerated common source amplifier that's loaded by diode connected Q10. So that'll have some negative gain. Maybe it's around one. Probably, hopefully, it's a little lower than one. Okay, so it's a negative gain, a little bit less than one. Then continuing around the loop, we can see from the gate, this gate here, same node we were just at, from that gate of Q11 
down back to here that completes the loop, we've got another common source amplifier, this time not degenerated, that's loaded by another uh, diode connected transistor. So we got another gain of about negative one. So you end up with a positive gain, hopefully a little bit less than one <laughs> around that loop. So there's a bit of a, a stability issue there. The gain should be less than one, so it should be uh, stable. But some things, uh, some subtle things can happen. For example, specifically, um, let's say you chose to take uh, approach one that was mentioned over here, which is to say that you're going to put RB off chip, use a precision resistor, and you want to just to be perfect, like get as close as you can to a constant transconductance for some reason, right? So that, that would mean that you'd need a, to connect this uh, node to a, a pad on your chip, and then that's going to go to a package, some stuff on the package, down to a printed circuit board, and finally through a resistor. So all that junk hanging off that node, all that, that wiring and all that is going to give rise to some capacitance, right? Probably quite a bit compared to the parasitic capacitances elsewhere in this loop, which means that at some modest frequency, um, this node will start looking like it's shorted to ground. And that in turn means that the first amplifier stage of this feedback loop we identified is no longer source degenerated. Right, the source degenera degeneration was helping us kill the gain, right? But actually, at high frequencies, um, that degeneration's kind of gone at that point. And then you start getting really close to a gain of one, positive gain of one around this loop, or probably even going over it in some, some corners, right? So, uh, and that, that, uh, that'd be pretty hard to avoid if you want to put RB off chip, actually. So the circuit, as it's shown here, is... is um, you know, finicky, not often used, especially when RB is off chip. There's even a fourth challenge here, which I'll, I'll discuss in a second. But here's a little bit, a um, little bit different um, version of that circuit that addresses some of those shortcomings. So now, uh, you know, it, it seems a little bit more complicated because we've introduced this amplifier in there. Just keep in mind, the amplifier doesn't have to be a very Complex amplifier could be a really simple single stage thing, active loaded diff pair, something like that. Um, but effectively here we've we've flipped things around so that this is really or to draw it properly, this is really our, our sort of constant GM nugget there, right? Those are the two transistors that are sized four to one. So if we can ensure that they have very close to the same drain current, then we've got that four to one ratio in current densities so that we'll get um, half of the effective 14 equal to V, which is equal in turn equal to V effective 15 will be the, oh, I wrote, I wrote the polarity wrong there, will be the voltage drop um, on resistor RB in this case, okay? So um, the reason we flipped it around is because in a lot of CMOS processes, it's a lot easier to um, wire the body separate independently for a PMOS transistor than it is for an MOS transistor. So um, for that type of CMOS technology, uh, if you use a PMOS transistor, you can short the source to the body for Q15, and that kind of eliminates the body effect. All right? So that's the bullet here. So that's the reason that it, you know this the circuit it's flipped around, it's flipped upside down. Um, but what that implies is that now, right, RB, the value of RB is related to V effective of and therefore GM of these PMOS transistors now. So just keep that in mind that the, the resulting current here is now in this circuit, it's the current that's required to establish a constant transconductance in PMOS transistors. Whereas in the preceding slide here, <laughs> this current ID13 <laughs> is the current that's needed to establish constant GM in NMOS transistors only. There's no reason why that the NMOS transistors and the PMOS transistors will track each other, right? So um, you could have two chips, uh, the GMs of the uh, NMOS transistors are the same in both those chips, and the GMs of the PMOS transistors are totally different. Okay. 
So, um, so wherever you hook up that, this little constant GM cell here determines which type of transistors are really uh, being held constant con or being biased with constant GM. And the other ones can vary quite a lot. Um, so that's one, one difference here. So for example, if you use this current here, mirrored it around, and used it to bias the NMOS diff pair, you no longer have any assurance of constant gain. So anyway, use, uh, making the body contact one way or another eliminates the body effect. Um, uh, instead of cascoding, this, this op amp kind of provides a, a, a very precise current mirror. Why? Because it's, you know, you can imagine that the feedback establishes a kind of virtual short circuit between the inputs of the op amp, if you assume an ideal op amp in a stable loop. Um, and so that means that the drain voltages of all these transistors, Q12, 13, 14, 15, are all the same. So that you know helps ensure a really good current mirror, mirroring. Um, and then finally, it's relatively easy to stabilize um, uh, this loop. You can apply a compensation capacitor here. I won't go through detailed stability analysis, but you can uh, in introduce a compensation capacitor on that gate and um, and make sure that the loop has good phase margin. But there's still um, uh, one practical problem, both with this circuit and uh, the one I showed before, the NMOS, the flipped around one, the original one. Both of those circuits, if you, if you look at them, they can sort of live and be stable and happy in a mode where all the currents are zero. So if we just think about what that would look like, right? You could have zero current here. So uh, this voltage could be low at zero volts. This voltage, you know, if this is VDD, this could be up around VDD. Um, and there's no reason circuit couldn't sort of stay like that, right? This voltage here would, could be just a little bit higher than this one. And it would just sit there. Um, so that, that's no good. Um, basically, this circuit has two stable points. One is the all zero state. And the other one is when it's the one you want, where it's biased with the proper current that keeps constant transconductance. So it's an example of a biased circuit. And there's many of these. This is another just general um, principle to keep in mind. It's an example of a bias circuit that requires a little help getting started up. So we'll show that you know you can introduce a couple transistors here that just kind of give it a kick when you first power things on and get it into the proper operating state. Another problem that's fundamental to using a constant GM biasing strategy is just that the currents and voltages uh, will have to vary a lot with MOS device parameters in order to maintain that constant GM. So, you know, the example it's given here, right? At high temperatures, the carrier mobility decreases, and so V effective has to increase in order to maintain constant GM. So that's just one example, but there'd be other variations too with threshold voltage and so on. So what that means is that the actual, in terms of the voltages in the circuit, um, it's not a very constant biasing arrangement. I think the voltages are going all over the place in order to maintain constant GM. So, um, the reason you might care about that is because then, um, you know, your V effectives in particular are usually what determines the swing you have available at various nodes in the circuit. So if the V effectives go way up, you might not have enough swing available to you in some stages. So for that reason, the you know constant GM biasing um, often runs into a, some problems, especially at high temperatures and when you have low supply voltages. The combination of those two is uh, is tough. But anyway, it's one, it's one, you know, again, biasing is a little bit about having a bag of tools right at your disposal. And so it's one, one tool, in the tool chest that you can whip out when, uh, when needed. So that on its own, it's, it's, that's nice and all. It generates this one bias current that's, uh, that has this nice property. But what we probably really need is not just that one current, but we need from that to generate a whole bunch of bias voltages that we're going to use in the gates of NMOS and PMOS transistors and 
mirror currents all over the place and bias a whole bunch of stuff. So um, now the the simple one simple thing you can do here is just take this this node here and just connect it to another NMOS transistor. If you size that the same as Q13, then you got another copy of that current nominally, right? And you can keep playing that game. You can get lots of copies of that, that current. So that's fine. Basically, you've got an NMOS voltage, an NMOS gate voltage here. And similar, you can do the same thing with this over here. If I take this, put it into another PMOS transistor, now I've got another potentially scaled copy of, of uh, the drain current through 13 and 14 there. But now I'm, I have a PMOS version of it, right? So that I can bias things from, uh, from VDD, from up above. But you know, we know that a simple um, current mirror like that may not provide a high enough output resistance for a high gain amplifier, right? A lot of the op amps we talked about required cascoding. So this is just a, um, an additional little step that's needed is to generate those cascode bias voltages. Um, so here's the, the, again, a basic trick for doing that. Um, and the easiest, you know, the easiest way to consider this circuit at first is just to take n equals one. So for the case where n equals one, We'll just keep this simple. This transistor Q5 oh, um, is quarter sized compared to everything else, right? Everything else is just W over L, W over L. But that guy, Q5, is one quarter sized. So you could see if, if, in a, you know, so if we size all the transistors in this way, and we ensure that these two currents are the same, they could be derived from a current mirror, right? So that they're they're matching each other pretty close. Then we know, right? We've got these two transistors here biased with um, the same same current, but Q5 has four times the current density, right? It's got four times current density under a square law. That means V effective five is going to be double V effective three, which means that VGS five is going to be that V effective plus the threshold voltage. So it's basically threshold voltage plus two of the Q3V effectives. Okay, we got that, that doubling of the V effective there, right? So that's the key point. It means that now we can, we've got this voltage here. That's another way to write that is it's one V effective. I'll zoom in a bit here. Plus a gate source voltage above ground, right? So that's that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to bias the gate of Q4 with because we want to have at least a V effective for Q, between the drain and source of Q3 to keep it in active mode. And then we got another VGS here Right, we get plus. We got plus VGS here. Okay. So that's um. That's the approach for generating that cascode voltage. Once I've got this voltage here, I can use it again and again. Use it wherever I want to bias other cascode current mirrors. Now I've got both the voltages I need. One for Q2. One for Q1. And I can just keep going. I can make more mirrors to my heart's content. So one um, tricky thing here is that this, uh, the way it's 
shown with the ratio of four there ensures that Q3 is right on the edge of active mode, right? It's right on the edge of triode because we've allowed just exactly one V effect of three over here, right? Between drain and source. So as soon as this current here changes a bit or that the current mirror is not perfect, um, then Q3 is going to dip into triode. Even if those currents are perfectly matched, to be honest, the, R, the RDS, the R out of, of Q3 right on the edge of triode is not going to be great. Um, it's going to, we're going to have a, lot, a slightly larger RDS if we can provide a little bit extra margin here so that VDS of Q3 is a little bit more than V effective. So in practice, what's usually done is we take that, this transistor here, Q5, even a little bit smaller than a quarter. We create a ratio a little bit more than a quarter, maybe a fifth or a sixth. And then that means that VGS of Q5 is even a little higher, and that gives us a little bit extra, a little bit extra drop here. I'll just put it as a little plus delta V there on VDS of Q3, so that there's a little bit of room for that node to wiggle around, and RDS3 will still have a pretty, a pretty high value. Okay. So, um, again, that's the basic premise, right? It's, it's kind of similar. It's riding on establishing this ratio of current density so that we get, uh, so that we can say that the V effective is doubled and, you know, we make use of that. And then in general with biasing, I mean, this current mirrors, you can already get the feeling, current mirrors are used extensively, right? You just start making copies of currents and from those are derived other voltages and so on and so on. That's the way biasing works. So just keep in mind, this is point is being made specifically for this circuit, but in general, right, bias circuits, they're kind of like auxiliary, they're kind of like this auxiliary overhead, right? I mean, if, if you could somehow get these voltages out of thin air, you would. I mean, they're not doing, they're not processing any signal or anything. So you generally, you always look for opportunities to scale down these currents. So don't forget, I mean, once you have a certain current over here, or let me put this another way, if you need a current of 200 microamps, there's no reason why you need to make this current over here 200 microamps, right? You can, you would, you can make it 10 microamps. Then it burns less power, and you just put a 1 to 20 ratio over here, and you got your 200 microamps. So you always kind of look for opportunities to scale down these currents, um, because they're kind of like just wasted, wasted power. Now there's a limit to that, which you know you're familiar with from like our previous discussions. I mean, you you could say why not just scale it all the way down to one nanoamp or you know a picoamp. I mean, at some point the size of the transistor starts getting so tiny that that the threshold voltages are not reliable. They're varying a lot. Like mismatch starts to come in, and the bias circuit's not going to be very uh, very reliable anymore. It's going to be all over the place. So that's that, though that kind of consideration often establishes a lower limit on how small you can make those currents. Yeah, and that's a good point too. Yeah. So as you make the that could be another thing that limits you from using really small really small values of current. As you you decrease that current, the GMs inside the bias circuit come down. So you can imagine that results in, you know, kind of uh, you know, we know that the gate referred noise of MOSFETs is inversely proportional to their GM. So you end up with them having a little bit more gate referred noise, gate referred thermal noise. Yeah. And even sometimes there may even be some stability issue that comes in that, that may also affect you, prevent you from going to really low currents. Depends on your kind of target. Okay. So here we're putting these two things together. Um, see what a more complete um, constant GM bias circuit might look like. So here's the, um, this is our constant GM part here. We use the second one there with the PMOS transistors. And again, the numbers beside each transistor are their W over L ratios. So we've got this 4 to 1 ratio here. So that means that the current that's through here is going to um, ensure that GM of Q14 
is 1 over RB. Okay. Okay. Um, so then, but that's not enough. We've got now, we've got two voltages, a PMOS and an NMOS voltage, but in the end, we want a circuit that really gives us four bias voltages. Uh, the bias P and cask P voltages will be useful for making a cascode PMOS current source. And then these two voltages down here, right? We're going to also, we want to be able to, oops, we want to be able to use them for making NMOS cascode current mirrors. So, so far we've got two of them. So we need to generate uh, the other two. So those are, that's done here with these extra, these extra current mirrors. So uh, first, let's take a look at what's going on here. Here we've got um, a one to five mirror here, right? Five to one. So this guy over here has one fifth let's say ID1 is one-fifth the current in the constant GM circuit. So it means that um, this transistor here, Q14, has five times the current density compared to Q4, right? So that's why here, right, this, this branch here generates our PMOS bias, and since this guy here has five times the current density, it generates a suitable corresponding cascode PMOS bias voltage. Okay. So there's a bit of a trick there, right, in, in the sense that you might, you might have the kind of naturally expected that, well, aren't I going to use this for my PMOS bias? No, instead that one ends up being used for the cascode bias, partly because you can see, I mean, Q14 has a relatively high current density already because you know we had to have this 4 to 1 ratio over here for the constant GM circuit to work do its thing right so it kind of makes sense that Q14 is the one that's biased at the higher current density so let's use its gate voltage as the cascode voltage and then with this branch we come in and generate the bias the V bias P uh, voltage and over here we mirror things over one more time now we've got V bias P and V cask P so we can make a nice copy of that current. This one's now, again, back to being uh, five times bigger. So ID7 is, is uh, actually five times bigger than ID1 because of this ratio here, 10 to 2. Um, and so that guy is now pumped through Q5. It's got five times current density compared to Q1, so it generates a suitable cascode, NMOS cascode voltage here. So we needed, you know, it, does, it kind of makes sense. We needed four branches here. We generated the four bias voltages that we need. And then finally, last part here, these are just some extra, transistor, uh, extra transistors we have to add to prevent that all zero state at startup. So if you think about what, hap what might happen at startup, what's the all zero state? Let me just clean this up a bit. The, all, the, the zero current everywhere state here would be the PMOS gate up at VDD. This guy's up at VDD. And the NMOS gate's down at ground. Zero, zero over here. So what happens then? Well, if this, this full, if the circuit's still asleep, right, if it doesn't wake up, Right, this node here is up at VDD, which means this guy is off at startup. And over here is a tiny little transistor Q8 that you can see is has a gate connected to VDD. So as long as there's power to this circuit, as long as VDD is is on, Q8 is going to be on. Okay. Uh, now it's made so 
it's, it's sort of an always on transistor. So that's a bit of wasted. It means there's going to be a bit of wasted current here. So typically, we'd make it really small. So we don't want to waste much current at all. And when I say small, I mean it can be really, really small. Um, this isn't doing anything useful once the circuit is started up at all. So you can just, you know, micro, a microamp is enough, right? Even less. All that it has to do is with Q9 off, even if that current is tiny, it won't take long for this node to drift down, down, down. And then once it gets low enough, it turns on these two transistors, Q10 and Q11. Right? So as, soon, as long as VDD is there, that node is going to get, their gate is going to get pulled down. Once they're on, they're going to start pulling these nodes up. Those are the NMOS gate nodes. It's going to pull them up and turn on everything, basically. Once those nodes are sort of a VGS above ground, then all the NMOS transistors, Q1, Q5, Q12, Q13, importantly, they all power up, they start drawing current. And then once the thing is out of the zero state, it only has one other stable state. And that's the state that we solved for, where there's constant GM on the left and everything else is mirrored over. And then the thing kind of settles into this new state, which is the one you want. Now, once that sort of equilibrium, new equilibrium is reached, then at that point, V bias P is whatever it needs to be, right? To make the, all the current mirrors working, which means that Q9 is now on, okay? Because we've made Q8 so tiny, Q9, Q9 being on will, it's gonna overwhelm, it's gonna overwhelm Q8 and pull this node back way up again, back up to VDD. It's gonna turn these guys off and effectively, the startup circuit goes away, right? It gets disconnected from everything else. So all that's left is these two transistors that are on, leaking a little bit of trickle current here, whatever is required because of Q8. So that's the way this startup circuit works, right? It uses this initial pull-down transistor Q8 just to kind of get things going. And then uh, once everything's going, Q9 comes along and turns itself off. So that basic, you know, that basic premise is is uh, useful in lots of different places. There's there's other examples of analog circuits that need a little kick to get them started, and you you know there's usually some combination of transistors like this that can do the job, right? You, you just make sure there's one transistor that's that's on as long as VDD is there, it's on, right? And that just gets everything in motion. So that's, um, once you've got that, that's, so you can see, right? This is just to generate the four voltages that we always take for granted and all the schematics. It's quite a bit of work, right? To get all this uh, going. It's conceptually simple, but of course, you know, you do have a feedback loop here in the constant GM cell. It has to be, you know, you have to ensure stability on a certain level of performance that's needed. You can't have these nodes being too noisy or, or anything. Um, and once you design this, you're just going to use these voltages everywhere in your circuit. And so it, it, it establishes the V effectives of all the transistors in your main circuit. So it, you know, in turn, basically it dictates the performance of the main circuit as well. So it's really, it's really critical um, to get that part right. So once you've got once you've got the typically the way that chips are made or just as was shown in the first slide you've got a central bias circuit somewhere that's shared by a whole bunch of analog circuits because you don't want to have to replicate that circuit a hundred times right for every little current source you're not going to make one of those those bias circuits you just put one off to the side and then you use a series of mirrors to send those um, that bias to distribute it all across the chip, hopefully, or at least over part of the chip. If the chip is huge, you may indeed need more than one bias circuit. But um, but you at least want to you know share it amongst a certain area of the chip. So uh, just a key point here. This is a little practical, nitty gritty thing. Let's say this is a uh, bias current in our bias circuit that. 
we use to establish the voltage we called V bias N. That's the gate bias for an NMOS current source, right? The bottom transistor in a cascode NMOS current source. You might say, okay, great, I've got this voltage. I'm going to just send this voltage to uh, everywhere I need it. I need it for a circuit over here, another circuit over here. I'm just going to send this voltage everywhere. This is not usually the, the best approach. Um, you know, and the, the idea being these circuits are relatively, let's say they're relatively far apart. Um, a large problem with, with this being that, I mean, you're now establishing, effectively, you're relying on forming a current mirror between Q1 and Q2, which may be really far apart. And that's always a bad idea. Okay, remember that mismatch increases with the distance between two transistors. We always neglected that extra term in the mismatch, um, in, in, in our modeling of mismatch, because we assumed that if we really cared about matching between two transistors, we'd put them right next to each other. And then the distance term would be negligible. But if we do things this way, you know, that, that distance term will dominate. Well, we could have, basically, what it comes down to is you could have a really different threshold voltage on Q1 and Q2. And then those currents would be totally different. So instead of doing it that way, the better approach, if you need an NMOS current source over here generating some current IC, you'd actually use a PMOS mirror. This is over here in your bias circuit. Okay? You would take your, the V bias P, let's say, pump that into gate of a PMOS transistor Q3, and that generates a current ID now. It's still just one wire that you're sending across the chip. But you'll notice that we're basically forming now the gate voltage, V bias N. We're forming it locally inside the circuit that's using it right next to Q2 so that the mirror Q1 and Q2 you know, can be laid out right next to each other and minimize the mismatch of it. So it assumes, uh, uh, you know, you get a better, more reliable matching there. This is sometimes called current distribution because it's really what you're sending across the chip. The quantity that's determining the bias is, is the current ID here. So it's like you're distributing a current rather than a voltage. Now, whenever you've got a wire, I mean, that wire has a voltage on it. Um, you might say, really, you know, what's the difference here? I mean, in both cases, I've got a wire with V bias N on it, right? The same is true over here. But the difference is that in the top, V bias N is being determined by this transistor that's way over in some corner of the chip, whereas in the bottom picture, V bias N is being determined by Q1, right next to where you're going to use it. That's what I would say. So, I mean, the distinction between voltage and current distribution, I don't know, I find it can get a little confusing. The main point is that, I think the simpler point that's obvious is you keep the mirrors together when you're doing this. Now, it, it means that, you know, compared to the top picture, you've, what's, what's sort of annoying is that you've got this extra current ID that you have to generate. It's like an extra branch of bias current that you're just throwing away just in order to send the signal across the chip. It's uh, still generally that's the way it's done, and and again with you can scale that current down so that it's small. That, that's what, usually what you would do, just to minimize the the waste. Okay. So that's um, you know going back to the top picture here. You know all that is talking about talking about this. You know we talked about this circuit so far. Okay. So some bias circuit, we, we talked about constant GM, but there's other even simpler circuits that are just used to generate some gate voltages, right? Generate some drain currents. Um, constant GM is an interesting one because it maintains a constant GM, but everybody, you know, there's other flavors of circuits that just generate some kind of gate voltage. And then it's distributed, right, to all the analog circuits, usually using that current mode approach, right? Um, there may or may not be a pin here to an external resistor. Um, yeah, so, so that's that. Now, uh, so the next part we'll talk about 
how uh, you can create an absolute reference. And sometimes that absolute reference is in turn used in the bias circuit as well. But let's, uh, we'll take our, our five minute break now. We'll do that after the break. Mm-hmm.